We talk about the alpha and omega of all life. So back in 1997, in the fall, I entered ministerial school, and they had just changed the program. Someone had donated a million dollars to the United Center for Spiritual Living to revamp their ministerial program. So they, the leaders connected with Obadiah Harris, who was the head of the Philosophical Research Society, and they combed the country for different professors. They wanted to get an accredited program. So they needed to get the prof different professors from around the country to be distant learners. So we had both in-person in learning as well as distant learning long before COVID hit. <laughs> so we have... Um, these incredible professors, but there was one that sticks out tremendously, and his name is Dr. Dean Brown. He was a physicist. He was an elder statesman. I, I call him a statesman, but he was just a genius. He worked with Albert Einstein as a physicist. Most of his career was with DuPont. And he was what, why he mesmerized me is because he was so open to the world, to everything. There was no limits to what he was interested in. So he said his favorite thing to do on a Friday night was to sit under a light and read physics books. <laughs> but he loved poetry. He loved sexual poetry. He loved, I mean, there was no limits. And he learned Sanskrit so he could read the Hindu scriptures from the original language. There was no limit where he would stop. Like, to him, the entire universe was his oyster. And so we're talking about this month, our divine inheritance. And today we're talking about the alpha and omega of all life. And he's someone who seemed to really encapsulate that, even in the way he lived. So the very first, they called it a colloquium, was where they invited these distant professors and we'd all meet with, them, with the students so we can meet them even though, because that was the only time we're gonna meet them in person. And so you had these different professors speak, and these are college, university professors, so they're all speaking eruditely. Um, Reverend Irvana Gale is a minister in a community like this. He was down at Agape. Pure love, just radiated, unconditional love. He was due to speak that afternoon, so I was heading towards the room where Reverend Irvana was speaking and Dr. Dean Brown was leaving. Actually, this was two years into the program, so I had, I had taken his class, so I had a, somewhat of a connection with him. I said, why are you leaving? And he said, oh, I've heard him before, and he doesn't really resonate with me. And I said, no, he's really good. You just have to listen differently. We all are used to listening with our heads, but Nirvana speaks from his beingness. It comes to his body, and so you have to listen from your body, and then you'll get it. This is a guy who's worked with Einstein. He's like I'm early 30s. He's many decades more than that, and he could have just, I mean, he, is, he doesn't need to listen to this person, but he goes, oh, okay, I'll try, and he just turned around and went back into the room, as any good physicist would do. I'll, ex I'll experiment with this. Totally fell in love with Nirvana, started communicating and just was like, became his biggest fan. And in one of these colloquiums, then um, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Brown is giving his talk and he says the most amazing thing. He says, well, he, he, I don't even know of the whole context. All I remember him saying, he's talking about saying blah, blah, blah. And he goes, and you know that experience when you experience all of the past and all of the future in the present moment. And then he just kept going as if that was all of our foundation. <laughs> I'm like, so I went into him afterwards. I said, you know, I know you said that, but you know, I've never had that experience. And my assumption he, was he was going to say, oh, yeah, of course, that's, you know, we all have our own experiences. But instead, his response was, you haven't? <laughs> well, why not? <laughs> Demand it of the universe. It's your right. <laughs> that is a man who understands divine inheritance. And he taught that way. So why I remember him the most, actually, is the assignments that he gave us. He gave us, and there's two in particular. One assignment was to write, a, have a communication with ourselves back at the big, be, big Bang. Like, just imagine who we were, whatever that was for us, and have a, and that was our paper. 
There was no structure. Remember, we're in this, we want to be accredited, and we're trying to do all this academic stuff. And he's like, write a letter to the Big Bang, to yourself at the Big Bang. And he didn't say, write a book. He didn't say what the topic was. He didn't say what the point was. Where are we trying to get to? It was wide open. Whatever you wanted to write back, psh, your mind just goes, who, think, who, who does that? Who since found thinking about communicating yourself with at the Big Bang? Net, another assignment was, OK, now I want you to write about, I want you to write a letter from your future self to yourself now. And your future self is 30,000 years in the future. So not 100 or 300 years, 30,000 years in the future. Because it's not just like limited fantasy, oh, I could think of it. We had to write it down and make it into a paper that we had to turn in. That took thought of who I was in 30,000 years, 30,000 years and who, what I wanted to say to myself now. And I can tell you, I still can remember, we wrote a ton of papers for that program. I remember that one. Because we were, it was so exciting to be so outside of the box of how we normally, normally see our world. We are so time focused in this time and in this space. And even if we go back historically, well, 100 years ago, that seems like a really long time ago. But when we're looking in the infinite, the infinite suddenly our mind goes beyond anything that we normally think about and we remember it because it's so powerful. I still access what I wrote because I'm like, oh, that was really good. I think I, <laughs> I go back. Then, if, for those of you who've read Autobiography of a Yogi, and, and you can have writ, um, read other things like Autobiography of a Yogi, but I'm specifically speaking of chapter 43 where his guru is resurrected and comes back and explains the other side of the veil. And it's so vast. Like mostly when people have near-death experiences, it's just what they experience is just as they go over to the other side. What Sri Yekteswar is describing is this incredible, first the energy body, like it's vast. He's like this human world is so tiny. It's, it's like a little basket and the subtle realm is the big balloon. It's huge and there's all these different worlds and vibrations and levels, and he, so he did, goes into detail. So it's not just like, I'm giving it to you conceptually, I'm not gonna, because it was a long chapter, but he goes into detail, and then he goes in, and then when you're finally ready to move on from that one, you move into the causal realm, and then that's this big, all ideational world, and then when you finally move through all of these experiences of just be, time beyond what we can ever imagine, you're finally ready to move into the oneness of all life where you are fully individualized and one all at the same time and, no, and free of all physical, energetic, and causal bodies. So we have this one professor where I'm expanding in linear time, one where I'm expanding in spiritual time. That's freedom. That is this extraordinary, unlimited, unbounded infinite. And what my experience is every time I go into that realm, and I invite you, by the way, if any of those ideas excite you to try it yourself, write, go home or write a letter from yourself 30,000 years from now to now, it's way fun. When I'm meditating, I can get into these places of joy, this, this expanded state when the boundaries and the walls start to fall, I go into greater and greater joy and the freedom. But I notice something. I notice that I could be in all the freedom that I want, beyond what I can really imagine, truthfully, and jo joy, but without love, it felt empty. It was, there was this emptiness to it. Like I liked it, I enjoyed it, but I didn't feel connected because love is about connection. It's not just an isness. It's very hard to tap into love as an isness. Usually, um, I get this from Pierre Taylor de Chardin, who was a Jesuit priest and paleontologist. He, was, he worked hard in integrating evolution with um, spiritual truths. 
And he talks about his, his passion was the power of love. That love is this force that, can, that changes all of our lives all of the time. And, and the, he's pointing to notice anything that you do, you do because you feel attracted to it. There's a desire to connect. If you don't have any desire to connect with something, you're probably not going to move forward. At least with your heart open, you might do it begrudgingly because you have to. But we know that that's just a, a, um, a way of living that just brings suffering. But if you, as long as we have choice, there's times when we don't have choice, but as long as you have choice, the thing you're going to choose is something you're attracted to, that you want to feel a connection to. So the question that I started to ask myself was, well, doesn't that very connection break down my freedom? Because part of the freedom is being disconnected. I don't, I don't have to connect to any one thing. I am just so unlimitedly free, but as soon as, soon as I love and get attached to something and connected with it, there's suddenly like, now I want to be with that. And then my, my walls come in a little bit. So what I love about what Taylor Desjardins, it's a French name, I'm still stumbling over it, Taylor Desjardins. One of the things he's pointing to, and I think is so valuable for all of us in this world where, there's, where loneliness and isolation are so huge, is to love everything. That our biggest problem is not loving, it's loving everything. It's not just loving the special people, the special community, the special job, the special home that you have, the community you live in, your views, whatever that is, to open our hearts to love everything with our whole heart, body, mind, and soul to give ourselves in love constantly, all day long. You can give yourself even like, oh, look at this room. You can give it to an object. And just, you could choose to love it. You can say, it, you may or may not like it. We're still working on the back here. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Because when we truly love, we accept the good and the bad in our hearts. If you're, only ed if you're always trying to edit out the bad stuff, then you're, just that mere act of editing closes our heart a little bit. Okay, I might not prefer something, whatever that is, but I'm going to work hard at keeping my heart open and deeply. For those of you who don't know, one of my favorites is uh, George Washington Carver. I read a book about him called The Man Who Talked to Flowers. For those of you who didn't know, he invented a lot of things. Uh, one of them uh, he, he's known for inventing, he came up with 500 different uses of a peanut. Peanut oil, shampoo, and he even brought him to Congress with all his inventions. It was extraordinary. And, he would, and what he would say is, I take whatever is before me. And he was known for doing this with a flower. He would just stop in a field and, and just give his entire heart to this one singular flower. He would just be with it, love it, just pour his heart into it. And he said, if you love it deeply and widely enough, it will reveal the secrets of the universe. Yeah. The everything in this universe contains the whole cosmos and contains this infinite world that we can't even begin to imagine, that contains the 30,000 years in the future and back to the Big Bang and the other dimensions of reality. It contains all of it. And so we give our heart to every aspect, and that's how he said he figured out all these inventions of how to deal with a peanut. And he said, I gave my heart to it. I just sat there, and I opened my heart, and it started revealing its secrets to me. And I could start creating from the secrets. So we spend so much time seeking, 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 seeking. I'll do this path, and I'll do that, and I'll do this experiment. I'll do this. But just wherever you are, you are musicians. What's that song, Love the One You're With? <laughs> What's that song? That's the song, Love the One You're With? Yeah, so, so you, want, you might have your, your, your ideal, your, this is who I want to be with. This is, who, this is not the right person. I want to be with someone else. You always have these ideals that take us away from where we are now. Um, I just remember Reverend David of Alt has the name of a book, The Grass is Not Greener on the Other Side. <laughs> to love up so deeply and profoundly because one of the reasons, one of the reasons why we hold on when we get it is because we think love is limited. Oh, I can only get love from this source. So we focus in on that source because I've experienced more love here than I have over here. But if we continue to say the world is 
infinite, infinite, and we practice being in love as much as we possibly can, day in and day out, we don't have to hold on so tightly because we know there's no one person, no one relationship, no one experience or condition that contains love. Love is in, through, and as all of life, and the way we access it is to give ourselves. And by the way, kindness is just such a beautiful way to do it, because sometimes just loving something seems abstract. So one way you might, if, if you don't have time to sit and meditate for hours focused on a flower, you can just say, oh, how can I give a moment of kindness in this moment? Just that one little act of how can I give kindness in this moment, in this moment, in this moment, keeps our heart opening and opening and opening. And so that wonderful, infinite freedom that is our divine inheritance and the pure and power of love become one. They're not divided. For, so for me, it was divided for a long time because when I loved something, I loved it almost exclusively and intentionally that it started creating walls. And so I had to learn how to love there are things, there's no question there's things that we love more easily and feel more connected to. I'm not denying that experience for people. But that is not a reason to shut our heart down to the things that are less loving. The other aspect that makes loving hard is pain and suffering. When we don't like people, and generally we don't like people because we feel unsafe around them, we feel we have to protect ourselves from them. How do we love and keep our heart open when we also are protecting ourselves? Well, one way that we keep our heart open is we do protect ourselves. It's okay to have boundaries, but when we're a little bit of distance, still practice love. Don't let that be an excuse not to love. You just might feel safer loving from a distance, and that's okay. There's eight billion people on the planet. We are not supposed to be up close to all eight billion people. There are people we prefer to be in more, har that we're just energetically in greater harmony with. And so in, in that wonderful harmony, we can connect, but all that doesn't mean all the other people are discounted. They're also part of our love. They're also, but just in a different way. There's different forms of that love. And so we are committed to loving no matter what that particular relationship is like. And I'm talking about people, but there's animals, plants, preferences of where you want to live in the world, temperature, climate, all, you know, whatever. There's a million different ways we have preferences, jobs. These are, there's so many ways that we say, I prefer this, and because I prefer it, I'm going to give my, I'm going to attach to it and not stay open. So the practice of our divine inheritance is unlimited, infinite, free, unconditional love. Love without condition. Love without condition. At the same time, recognizing we're humans, so we might have some human conditions to keep ourselves safe, but at the same time, we are still called to keep our heart open. So what's happening also in this world with part of the isolation, and what we're noticing for those of you who are on a healing journey, there's a lot of material and practices and workshops on tra healing trauma. Trauma is a big issue for, um, I, I mean, I, I was working on something last year, so I started looking stuff up. I was amazed, like every spiritual teacher I knew was now doing trauma work, workshops, classes. It's become so big in our country. I mean, I don't know, maybe just because I was looking it up, it was like all over my, uh, probably it was the algorithm, it was everywhere, trauma, trauma workshops. And these trauma workshops had like 50, I'm like, who can do all this? This is crazy, you have so many different teachers. But what it taught me was like, oh, this is a really big issue. But I think sometimes when we get really excited about a healing process, um, it's important, but, and, we can sometimes make it more complicated. There's different elements of trauma healing, but the biggest element of trauma healing is just to feel. To feel whatever is in our body, not just in our mind. Oh, you know, I think part of the, the, the impetus was uh, talk therapy is got, what got too heady and it got disconnected from the body. And so we have to go into the body and say, okay, my head might say this is fine, but my body is telling me something totally different. 
and to listen to it. And the reason why we don't is because it can be so full of pain, so full of pain. And we feel tender and scared and vulnerable because the moment you tap into it, it's like all time disappears. You're right back. Wherever that pain was arise, wherever it came from, it's like it's right there. My first experience of it was I was doing, this is back in the early 90s, I think she did Feldenkrais or Welfing. What, Feldenkrais or, or Rolfing, I'm not sure which one she was. And so she, it was a, it's a type of body work. And at first, she's working on me, and first my back became all bruised, just from, I wasn't used to someone hurting me so much. It was really hard, it's not like soft massage, it's like, we're going deep. But then, then one day after doing this, and, and then I got used to it and it was fine, but then one time, I'll never forget it, I think I might have told this story, I don't know. She had me on my back and she started massaging right here, and I just started sobbing, sobbing. Like, and what, what happened was, is my, they didn't, you know, we didn't know as much back then. My oldest, my brother, um, as play, it was never meant, it's all about attention, and there was no intention to hurt. But out of play, he was tickling me. He used to tickle me, and what he would do is he put both legs on my arms so I couldn't move, and then go like this, and it, it trickled, you're laughing, oh, you're laughing, but it's torture. <laughs> That's why they call it tickle torture. And all of a sudden, what amazed me was everything went away, and I was right back there. Like, I was not in this room in 1990. I was a kid in the 1970s being tickle tortured. It wasn't, it's not like the big, I wasn't being, it wasn't mean, there was no cruel behind it. It was just, he thought it was funny. I thought it was funny too because I'm laughing, but I'm in so much pain, and it, it's confusing. But my, I guess my point is, is that even though I never thought about it, never once considered it, my body held that memory. That's what this. You might hear the word somatic. That's the somatic healing that people are doing. That we, our bodies have these different memories, and we might not even think about them or are aware of them. But the moment that part is impacted on our body, that's why people are going to do to do body work to open up those memories. The key then is what do we do with these memories? Um, obviously, there's so much on that. I'm not. I'm not going to either talk about it or portray myself as an expert, but I, I can say about one aspect of this that I think has always been with us, which is the power of forgiveness. I think when we start to feel things, it hurts, and we get scared, and we get vulnerable, and, but there's also a place, we have to feel the feelings, that's what everything, everyone teaches, you can't heal it unless you feel it. You have to feel the, heal, the pain and the suffering, but there's got to be a point where we forgive. And that is a tool that's been with us for, gen for thousands of years, to forgive. Not forgive too soon. That's what the somatic healers would say. Don't just go, oh, I'm, I'm forgiving. And then they touch you again, and you're like, no, I'm not, because you feel the pain. But you want that forgiveness to go deep into our soul. And the, the greatest, for me, the most powerful example of this is Louis Zappernini. Who knows Louis Zappernini? Who's ever heard of the book or the movie called Unbroken? Yeah. So I have not, I won't see the movie, but I did read the book by Laura Hildebram called Unbroken. And it's about Louis Zappernini. He was a track guy, and then he went off to World War II. And it's Laura Hildebram, she's the one who wrote Sea Biscuit, if anyone is familiar with that. She's an incredible writer. And his story is just brutal, awful. That's why I said I'm, I will never see a movie of this. It was just, it was so hard to read. And it just, like at one point you think he's gonna, it's gonna get better, you think he's saved, and then it just gets worse. And it's, it's, it's just torture. He had a, he was a, he ended up becoming a, um, in a Jap Japanese concentration camp with a particularly sadistic leader who just tortured in ways that, you know, just it's hard to believe. And so when he came back, World War II is over, he has what they didn't know at the time was PTSD. Could not function, these memories were just, I mean, it was, it was, and, and you, when he just would break down and he couldn't, the, the person that people knew when he left and who he was was not even, they couldn't, and they didn't know how to relate to him. Nobody knew about PTSD. He's just, un, cannot function. And so, and she talks, 
there, just quite a, about, a lot about that. But so I'm, I'm saying it quickly, but it's actually a long journey. At one point, he hears about this guy Billy Graham, and he's not at all religious, or he, but for something pulls him to go hear him hear Billy Graham. And my understanding is I haven't seen the movie, but the the they, the director made a choice of not putting this in the movie, and for me this is the whole reason for the whole story, so she took out the key. So he's listening to Billy Graham, and he's hearing about forgiveness for the first time. And he goes back to his barely functioning apartment, and he, he has an actual spiritual experience of forgiveness washing through, and for, through him. Towards the, the, towards the person who did all the abuse, towards the whole experience. And it wasn't of his mind, it wasn't because he was doing forgiveness exercises, it came with this whole soul desire to be willing to let it go through forgiveness. He's so forgiving that he ends up going back to the concentration camp, he ends up being an Olympic torch runner and goes to the exact place where he was, where he was tortured. He was free. I mean, listening to him, you can't even tell it's the same person. He's so full of light and joy, and it lasted. It wasn't like a moment of forgiveness, and then he's back in it. His body and his mind were tortured, and yet through this deep and really spiritual experience, his whole body, memories, got healed. And so as we're going through this process of I want to be in love with everybody and everything, we have to recognize that there are certain things that we may not understand why they are triggering us. They're like, oh, that's really, or that's, re like suddenly you just get, Burr. like, what, what is that? We don't want to go into judgment about ourselves. We all have it. Everyone has it individually. We have it collectively, these memories. And so we want to be kind and generous and loving and knowing as Taylor, Taylor, De, I was good at it and I forgot, Deschardins, we'll just say Deschardins, said that love is the ultimate power of the cosmos. And it is the most powerful force we can be. So when whatever we have, if we turn to love and say my desire and my intention is to heal this anger, this fear, this terror, whatever it is, the ways for each of us to heal individually and collectively are going to continue to show up in our life because we're willing, because we're committed to being a place of love, because love is our divine inheritance. We, it is, as that my teacher said to me when I didn't have that expansive experience, he said, it's your right. It is all of our right to know this infinite oceanic power of unlimited, unbounded love all of the time. It is all of our divine right through all history, through all our memories of the past, of what we are moving into in the future, in the transcendent, in every level and dimension of our being. It is our right, our divine inheritance to claim unlimited, unconditional love so that when we move through the life, through the world, that we are moving through the world with this deep, wide open hearts with a smile on our face that is genuine, not put on, not superficial, not spiritual bypass, but has this deep soul quality of love for this beautiful creation of divine love that surrounds and enfolds us. And we start to be able to see and feel and hear with the, with the heart of love in all that we do. That is our divine inheritance. We get there by going through the challenging parts. I'll just end with this because sometimes it can be a little abstract, I, I recognize. And so I was sharing with a class that I'm teaching different ways that we can access spirit. It could be anything, writing, reading, conversation with somebody, a spiritual process, meditation, prayer. It could, I mean, I just, I had like a list of 30 things. And it, it could be anything, anything that opens us up. The realization I had as I was writing this whole list that my deepest and most profound spiritual experiences always came when I was in pain. I have experience, I mean, Michael Beckwith, you go there, he's just pure joy, you go, and we'd we were we leave church, we had no idea what he was talking about, but we were just flying high in light. It was wonderful, you'd go into meditation, get into these spiritual states of high and wonderful, but the deepest experiences are the ones that went in, not just out, but in, and into the depths. And when I was feeling that pain, when I was feeling any type of hopelessness, when I was feeling 
self, very self-critical and not liking myself and not feeling worthy. Every time I've gone through those experiences, it's because in those experiences I realize I have no choice but to let go. I have no choice, and when we let go, when we feel that pain and we get to that place, I can't go any further, and we let go, what greets us is love. Every time. But we have to feel it to really feel it, because what happens is then the freedom way out there and the love that's way down here become married, and we become this wonderful inheritor of freedom and love, and that's God's gift to all of us. Let's pray. And so as we enter into prayer, we just surrender. We just are willing to let go in this moment. And even as we are willing to let go, we're just willing to let go even a little bit more. And let go even a little bit more. And just one more time, just let go just a little bit more. We are living in a universe of pure, unlimited, unbounded love. This is the true power of all life. It is the power of all creation. And we choose to know and to see that this is the source of who and what we are. We are, were born with this love. We were born as divine inheritors of this unlimited, all-powerful, all-knowing, infinite, free love. This is all of our divine inheritance now. And so we just joyfully let go and accept our divine inheritance. We don't have to work at it. We don't have to force it or make it happen. It's already been given. All the love of the universe is already given to each and every one of us individually and to all of us collectively. Love. We are safe in this love. We are safe in the divine love. We are safe in our divine inheritance. We can relax. We can let go. We can open, and we can allow whatever healing needs to happen, and we are safe when we are in that healing energy, even when it feels the darkest, even there. Love is the power of our life. There is where we are the safest, because we are opening to that which we can't control anymore, to that which we can't make or force. We are now just centering and melting and melting, and melting, and melting, and melting, and melting into this oceanic love. This is who we are. We claim it, we feel it, we accept it, and it is done. I invite you now to join me in letting this prayer be by saying, and so it is. Amen and amen. I walk in God in all.